this no thrill It's worse than nil So draw the right conclusion Let there be still Welcome to episode 74 of the Exploring Antinatalism podcast, a podcast showcasing the wide range of perspectives and ideas throughout antinatalism as it exists today through interviews with antinatalists and non-antinatalist thinkers and creators of all kinds, now running four years strong. I'm your host, Amanda Suknik, and today I'm speaking with the artist and developer behind The Pessimist, the world's first video game with an antinatalist and effortless theme, Nenad Goykovich. <laughs> Welcome to the Exploring Antinatalism podcast, Nanad. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you for having me on. Nanad, your in-progress game, The Pessimist, is shaping up to truly be a masterpiece of antinatalist art, uh, an incredible adventure into extinctionism, something the likes of which we have never seen realized before. Um, I absolutely cannot wait to get into all the details of this project with you today. Uh, but before we do, I would like to just ask you some basic questions first, as I always do. So far, I only really have known you as IP creator, but we've talked for a long time. Um, so this is a really nice opportunity also to kind of get to know you today for the first time. So let's start off with the most basic of questions. Who is Nenad Gojkovic? My name is Nenad Gojkovic. I'm from Serbia, the capital Belgrade. I am a hard surface concept artist by profession, specialized in uh, weapon, environment, prop vehicle, and architecture design for the entertainment industry. I have over 10 years of experience in it, worked on a number of games, uh, Call of Duty, Infinite Warfare, Metro Exodus, Borderlands series, uh, Atomic Heart, recently released, to name some. Haven't worked on a film yet, but I guess worth mentioning is that I was uh, approached by James Cameron Studio Delight Story Entertainment in 2017. They were considering me for the design of vehicles in these Avatar sequels. But unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, due to various reasons, I wasn't able to work on the franchise. I worked on my own IP instead, and uh, in retrospect, I'm glad I did. Up until recently, I have been a designer only, but a few months ago I started doing art as well, with the help of the Stable Diffusion text-to-image eye tool, with two art pieces already out and another one on the way. Uh, I guess I can be called an artist now as well, emerging one at least. What is your arts background and how long have you been working in game design in general? I have no formal education in arts, though I am a creative-minded individual, always was. I discovered concept art during high school quite by accident. Uh, some of my colleagues from here, I too had no idea at the time that there is this thing called concept art, that there exists a profession and a well-paid one too. I remember that faithful moment to this day, uh, staring at the screen, looking at some amazing uh, concept art uh, done for uh, games and movies I played and watched, and I said to myself, this is it. Uh, this is what I'll be doing for a living. Uh, there was no doubt about it. The good news was you didn't need a formal art or design education to enter the industry, which is true to this day. You can be self-taught. And so I took that path after high school. Uh, it was a very hard and risky path, but uh, the effort, all the effort and sacrifice paid off and I succeeded. After years of self-teaching and portfolio building, I was offered to work on the Call of Duty Infinite Warfare, my first gig. Uh, concept art is just one aspect of the production process for games and movies. Uh, game design would be another one. And when I started making what is now The Pessimist, I knew nothing whatsoever about it, nor about many other things related to game development. It's one thing to do concept art for games, entirely another to make one or basically all by yourself. So I was going the same uh, self-taught path uh, here as well, Lear learning along the way as I was making the game. Suffice to say, I now have five years of experience in game development, learned quite a lot during that time, and I am uh, confident I can successfully lead the full-scale production of The Pessimist, if it comes to it. 
Why are you an antinatalist? Because I'm depressed. Jokes aside, though that ain't far from the truth, uh, antinatalism appears to be the rational view of life. Ethelism even more so, but unlike the prior, the goal of ethelism seems unattainable. It's fiction, basically, and is precisely what can make it a seductive concept for fiction writers, as was the case with me. Ethelism appears to have reached the rock bottom of the truth well, so to say. Uh, the deeper you go down this well, the darker it gets, and more unpleasant truths you discover. Not many artists have been brave enough to lower themselves all the way down, making a, a touchdown in this absolute darkness where extreme pessimism rules. In Manham being the one. Uh, if I am correct, for over a decade now he has been screaming from the bottom of this well, but it looks like the screams are heard only so far up. Uh, I cannot but appreciate that deeply, despite all this controversy surrounding him. I'm not sure what exactly to call myself. Uh, I get the problem of suffering and I recognize the two prime solutions. Either eliminate life or fix it. Uh, this is also ref reflected in the game, inspired by transhumanism, we have translifeism, the, the term I coined for the black beings, a sentiocentric form of the prior, if you will. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's possible for our technology and our minds uh, as well to advance to some much higher level allowing for the emergence of a planetary utopia on Earth, a biosphere in which suffering, or at least severe one, is a thing of the past. I mean by changing this current socio-economic system, replacing it with something much better like the resource-based economy, Google Venus Project and Peter Joseph, which technically seems doable right now, we would eliminate wars and poverty and possibly many other negatives. So already it appears to be possible to lay the foundation for this planetary utopia. So yeah, what I am kind of changes with the mood, but uh, it's clear that the pessimism inside me is far stronger than optimism. I think ethelism is the most appealing to me precisely because it seems to go all the way down. Uh, no shyness, no incomplete conclusions, no bullshitting around, but fully transparent. It's picking all that nasty shit from the bottom of that well and throwing it up as far as it can at the society. Suffice to say, though I may not agree with all of ethelism, I respect it and uh, am very attracted to it. I guess I'm more like Sam, a semi ethelist uh, a red buttonist, a clean or instant execution of all life and nothing else. How did you originally become interested in antinatalism? I discovered one of Inmenham's YouTube channels, the physics one, the, the, the draft science. Uh, it just showed up in my recommendations one day and for a while periodically I watched content of that channel having no idea that he had all these other channels as well about the economics, philosophy and else. I began watching his philosophy videos with ever greater curiosity and attention and that's how I learned about both antinatalism and ethelism got sucked in suffering from chronic depression, being an atheist, etc. It didn't took much. So for the next two or so years I was absorbing content from him and everybody else in the community, you included. In the meantime I was having problems with the game then called Duro Concrete. Uh, with the story it just wasn't getting anywhere, uh, this time travel one, and one day I saw an article online titled uh, Fermi Paradox, the antinatalist hypothesis. In it there was an image of the space jockey by H.I. Geiger uh, used in the Alien movie. Uh, this strange looking white being. Uh, and it just clicked in my mind like that. This entire new story kind of revealed itself to me. Uh, what if there is a highly advanced uh, alien civilization out there that does nothing but search for life uh, in the universe and red buttons it. Maybe that's the solution to the Fermi paradox. And so the snowball was pushed and the thing just rolled down the hill and grew into what is now the story of the pessimist. Outside of Wikipedia, the word antinatalism is still not included or defined by any dictionary in the world in any language. I have twice now campaigned to have the word added into the Oxford English Dictionary, 
to no avail. And in addition to this, even the Wikipedia definition keeps changing. So how do you feel that antinatalism should be defined? So this is the definition of atheism I like, uh, I received from the chat GTP. Atheism is an empathetic philosophy which posits that the existence of sentient beings capable of experiencing suffering, whether terrestrial or extraterrestrial, organic or inorganic, is undesirable and thus advocates for their non-existence. The definition of antinatalism I use perhaps not as elegant as the atheism one. I assembled using parts from other definitions, says antinatalism is an empathetic philosophy, philosophical view that is against the reproduction of sentient earthlings as their life is permeated by badness. As you know, anti-procreation is sometimes broken up into four general schools of thought, antinatalism proper, ethelism, vehement, and child-free. Can you share your thoughts on each of these? All I can say here is that, as many others, I see ethelism as the extension of antinatalism. Antinatalism goes halfway, ethelism all the way. In a way, I view antinatalism as the socially more acceptable form of ethelism. But even antinatalism is eyebrow raising and David Bennett is forced to hide his face. You just can't say out loud certain things in our society, even if you, even if they are true or appear so. Try yelling, Allah doesn't exist in Saudi Arabia and see how that works for you. It's hard to penetrate the society, the mainstream, with these views, to communicate these unpleasant views to the, to the masses when they are programmed to chase the lollipop. Do you extend antinatalism to all life, to all sentient creatures? Are you a sentiocentric antinatalist or an anthropocentric antinatalist? Yes, I do extend it to all life. Uh, I mean, David Benetter does, as far as I know, so who am I not? It's his thing. So in addition to being a philosophical position, antinatalism over the last 10 years or so has also become a developing social movement as well. And since 2019, antinatalist activism has slowly started to leave the barriers of social media and begun and we've begun to see the emergence of things more akin to traditional activism, such as street outreach, meetups, and even the formation of, let's call them proto-NGOs, such as Child Free India, Stop Having Kids, Antinatalism International, uh, and Antinatalism Japan, also, which used to be known as the AAPJ, uh, or the Association of Anti-Procreationism in Japan. Are you familiar with any of these developments, and what are your thoughts on any of them, either way? Yeah, I am familiar with these organizations, Stop Having Kids being the most interesting to me. In countries you can do that kind of activity relatively safely, why not? Uh, surely it makes a difference to go out among people and to talk to them about antinatalism. U.S. seems to be one such country. As far as I know, no SHK activists have been attacked so far or not serious. To contrast, if I was to do that here in Serbia, or anywhere else in the Eastern Europe for that matter, there is a high chance I would have ended up badly beaten and thrown into a dumpster. I'm positive it would not be as tolerated as I see it being over there in the U.S. As you know, antinatalism and ethelism are fairly new themes to serve as inspiration for artists, and that's made them very exciting playgrounds as themes for those of us that have been artistically inspired by them. For you, what is it about antinatalism and ethelism that you find to be the most inspiring? Indeed, I see them as golden mines in terms of the themes they provide for more regional works of art of all kinds, uh, novels, games, movies, what have you. I noticed that I like doing things that basically no one has done before. It really makes me excited, this pioneering. So what makes the two so attractive to me is their obscurity, yet they pose very interesting and important questions about life, worthy of consideration. Speaking of games and movies, I don't really think the mainstream entertainment industry will ever embrace these uh, themes we value so highly. Rather, it's these smaller independent studios who are likely to explore them. Indie developers like me hope to be proven wrong. So now, please, let's talk about the pessimist. 
First off, I we really can't begin without at least a few words regarding just how beautiful this game is. It is stunning. Some of the most unique and detailed pixel art I have ever personally seen. On top of that, um, you've captured just the most extraordinary atmosphere through what I've seen so far. There have been a, a few smaller game projects that I've seen use themes of antinatalism and ethylism in the past. I mean, really obscure stuff, uh, with maybe one exception. Um, I think this is safe to say that this is probably, there's probably never really been anything like this before uh, your project, The Pessimist. Um, and I feel that this is really to be, this is really going to be quite groundbreaking. Uh, and I, I, I so very much want to see this project reach full fruition. I think, I truly feel that it's one of the most important pieces of antenatalist art uh, to ever be even attempted. Thanks, Amanda. I'm very glad I liked uh, what to say. I'm a non perfectionist. And the uh, Pessimist nicely reflects this obsession with details and the correctness. From what I have seen, a 2D game of this uh, or similar resolution, with fully from scratch, hand-drawn, handcrafted, freehand, pixeled, however you want to call it, graphics, uh, with high fidelity, photorealistic aesthetics, hasn't been done before. Uh, that aspect alone makes it unique. But there are others, of course. I really wanted, or I want, to make a one-of-a-kind 2D game experience, to be remembered. From what I have seen, this surely looks like the first or among the first antinatalism slash ethelism themed projects of a bigger scope. If it succeeds, meaning if the game, if the full game ever sees the light of day, that of course would be highly beneficial for all the philosophies explored, antinatalism and ethelism in particular. What is uh, what used to be known as raw concrete, now called the pessimist? What is the basic story and how did the idea for this project first come about? The pessimist is envisioned as a quite thought-provoking, quite long single-player epic adventure game, one that has a rather dark philosophical tone, one that explores themes not really explored before in the games industry, to my knowledge at least. The central character is an ex-prodigy, a wealthy prominent physicist and pessimist named Sam, the name translates to alone in Serbian language, in his 30s, who suffers from quite a few health problems. For one, Sam looks over a decade younger than he really is. Uh, suffice to say, he suffered a lot already and he continues to, but then all this a personal struggle is also the engine behind his excellence and determination to make all the difference in the world. Sam is a semi ethelist extinctionist, or perhaps a red buttonist would be a better description of him, as everything but instant painless annihilation of all life is not morally acceptable to him. Having the brains and the means and the assistance from few other brilliant like-minded individuals, he was able to create a device, a biosphere, Annihilator that can annihilate the entire planet Earth, basically, in an instant. During the development of this device, Sam discovered the so-called White Being, which turns out to come from an advanced alien civilization whose sole purpose or main activity is searching the universe for planets with life and red buttoning them. The White Being uh, will be one of the causes that sends Sam and Nobby his cat, on this long, exciting journey through, through, throughout the universe. They'll visit various alien uh, civilizations, planetary utopias and dystopias under control of these other beings, the blacks and the reds. In essence, trying to figure out what, who does what exactly and whose agenda, whose solution to the problem of life slash suffering to ultimately endorse in this far-reaching war of solutions they are in the middle of. As for your third question, five or so years back I was financially in a very good situation, which can't be said now, and I decided to initiate the creation of my own IP of some kind. Uh, it wasn't long before I decided to go with a game, a 2D pixelated one. Doing a 3D game didn't seem realistic and still isn't, in retrospect, it was a good decision, as even this 2D game is a ton of work already and is yet to be actually developed, if at all. How long have you been working on the game so far? Too long. 
Uh, I said it's been over five years now. It took, I don't know, uh, two or so years just to master this pixel art with photorealistic aesthetics. I had a solid uh, experience with hand-drawn photorealistic rendering prior to it, but not at such a low resolution. Though it was undoubtedly valuable, I had to acquire an additional set of skills to be able to be master in this micro world as well. As nobody has done the exact graphics before in such a way, to my knowledge, I learned all of it, all the, all the principles, the tricks along the way by creating scenes and else. The early scenes look awful, uh, everything looks off. Uh, getting the scale right proved to be quite a challenge because every pixel matters at this resolution, so a single pixel difference, though it may seem like irrelevant, makes a big difference actually. In the game world, uh, the pixel is like 5 by 5 centimeters or so. So yeah, you have to be careful and pay attention if you want things to look right or as much as possible. Is The Pessimist a solo project or is there a team behind The Pessimist? Initially it was. There was just me, but after a while being no professional programmer nor animator myself, I had to start hiring once. So a lot of people from around the world left fingerprints on this project, especially programmers. I lost count how many came and left. I am responsible for all the visuals, the story, many of the sound effects, and these simple frame-by-frame -frame animations. So yeah, you're looking at a team effort. I mean, it was a mess, really, looking back at the time of Raw Concrete. Uh, I have more or less mastered these pixelated graphics. But there was this persistent problem with the story. The, the foundation existed, uh, Sam, the cat, etc. It was good, but the never-ending question was what kind of a building do we make here? No direction seemed satisfying to me. I wanted something truly unique, an original story, and just couldn't come up with one. This undecisiveness for me had a negative impact on the rest of the team, and some key members eventually left. And I don't blame them, uh, simply the game wasn't going anywhere. So what happened next is that I stopped the development entirely to once and for all solve the story problem, save the game of the trash bin. The development ceased, the team was no more and I was alone again. And then Eureka, I found the perfect story, the story of the pessimist. Uh, that has been basically right in front of me for a while, as I was already familiar with antinatalism and nephilism. I adjusted the foundation to the degree it was necessary and more or less defined the entire story of the game, in many places to a great detail. Just to clarify, the game has gone through at least a few titles, and the current title is The Pessimist? Yes, that is the final title. It's short and to the point, and from what I have researched, hasn't been used before in a game or a feature film. Though there truly has never been anything quite like The Pessimist, there have been a few older video games in the past that have indeed had antinatalist and effless themes, most notably a game called Better Never To Have Won by the YouTuber Morality Without Addiction. Have you heard of this, and have you played uh, that or any of these other games before? Yes, I have tried the Better Never to Have Won. Uh, it's interesting and clearly he put quite an effort into it. Uh, other than it and now the, the Pessimist, I'm not familiar with other antinatalism or athleism team games. The outdoor sequences are particularly atmospheric and beautiful. You've spoken a bit on your Discord regarding how the frames were generated and you've mentioned that the pictures pixels are actually hand-drawn. Uh, can you tell me more about the drawing process you used to create these images? Yeah, nearly everything you see is entirely hand-drawn from scratch, often on a pixel level or to say with a brush the size of a single pixel. Other things are done with a larger brush size, for example clouds, terrains and the like. So it's a mix and I guess calling it a pixel art game wouldn't be fully accurate. I now prefer the term pixelated game. The only things that aren't hand-drawn from scratch are placeholders here and there, which are very few and usually obvious. One of the main reasons for doing graphics this way has to do with preserving visual consistency. I tried photo bashing, cutting assets from photos, further manipulating and scaling them down, but it didn't really work. 
no matter how you scaled them down to the needed pixel level, it all just looked awful, lacking detail and needing fixing by hand. It turned out that drawing everything from scratch is fa both faster and better. And even if the photobash worked, while it could have been used extensively for the creation of the first uh, basically non-fictional on Earth setting, you could not use it for all the all these other off-world fictional ones. So either it's all done one way or the other. Having a mix means having a weak visual consistency and that was unacceptable to me. Regarding the process itself, you create a layout of the scene. Like, for example, if the scene is an interior, you create some floors and walls and then draw over it all a rough concept of the entire scene. Then you make necessary changes to the space itself and start filling it with props one by one. You grab the needed reference photos from the web of all or some of the things that will make the scene. You scale down these photos quite a bit, not all the way, you need them in higher resolution still to be able to see more clearly how things look. And you start making the assets by replicating them in needed resolution. Some assets are made from imagination. People tend to be skeptical of this hand-drawn from scratch claim and on one occasion I had to prove it by uh, comparing a hand-drawn washing machine prop with its photo scaled down, front view of the machine. The lack of detail in the latter was apparent. Uh, it's, it's a great compliment of course when uh, people show suspicion, but at the same time it's unfortunate, as many people may see these scenes and just assume they aren't hand-drawn, not realizing the opposite reality and the amount of effort involved. I tend to emphasize this reality every time I share images of the game. Now, when you say hand-drawn, do you literally mean part of the process involves paper, pencil, paint, pens, and other traditional art mediums? Do you have video of this process? It just means that things are done manually or drawn from scratch by hand without any other method used. No cheating, if you will, no usage of photos or parts of photos for asset creation other than for reference. Are the outdoor sequences on Earth done now or how long did those take to complete? No, these three outdoor scenes aren't finished, especially the two large ones, animation-wise primarily. The smallest of the three, the first you would see stepping outside the house, is closest to the overall finish and it gives a good idea of what I am aiming for, for all the outdoor scenes in the game. High animation and sound effects, density, scenes teeming uh, with activity. Anywhere you'd look, there would be something happening. Many NPCs, many of which, if not all, you'd be able to interact with. As, speaking of NPCs, the first setting for example, it takes quite an effort to both create and animate a single human. In their case, those reference images or here photos of people, ideally in as orthographic uh, views as possible, uh, are scaled all the way down and then replicas are made over them from scratch. One can see this in the Kickstarter campaign video. Uh, it's quite a difficult process actually, but the end result is quite a novelty, I think. Anytime I show uh, people clips of these animated NPCs, they are amazed. Does antinatalism and or ethalism exist on Sam's Earth? Does Sam begin the game as an antinatalist or an ethalist, or is this something he only gradually begins to learn about as the game progresses? At the moment, if I'm correct, there is no mention of neither antinatalism nor nephilism inside this first setting. It may not be necessary to explicitly show their existence on Earth. We'll see. I had this idea or was just thinking about what the game would look like uh, if Sam wasn't antinatalist or semi ethilist but he becomes one after a period of time. It would probably be easier for the players in the sense that both players or most of them and Sam would be pro-life slash optimists on start and together over time by being put in various uh, situations 
they become pes pessimists, or at least Sam does. Simply, these anti-life ideas would be more digestible if exposed to more gradually, individually, rather than throwing it all at once uh, at these players, as would be the case with the game. As this cannot be changed, uh, as said, one of the goals, an important one of the first setting, would be to make Sam likable, relatable, to show clearly that he's not some Doctor of Evil, but on the contrary, an extremely compassionate, kind-hearted individual who sees all this internal and external suffering and is obsessed with doing something about it. The first setting would be more than long enough to do this effectively. Uh, the point is, after this long introduction, uh, while some players may still not be on Sam's side when it comes to his solution to the problem of suffering on Earth, all players are expected to more or less uh, like him at the end of this first setting as a person. What programs are you primarily using to create the game? I use Photoshop for all the graphics, an old CS3 version, uh, Spine 2D and Dragon Bones are programs that have been used for the skeletal animation which is and would be predominant in the game. And finally all of it is assembled in the Unity and Unity game engine, quite popular among indie developers. When do the events of the pessimist take place and what are some of the environments that we visit during the game? The game, the first setting takes place in the near future. We have these quite advanced humanoid robots in Sam's house, so though it probably won't be ever mentioned, it's the year 2040-ish. Uh, but other than these robots and a few other things, there won't be much else to suggest this year as the city or the country Sam is in is like Cuba, uh, kind of frozen in time in the late 90s due to severe sanctions. The point is I wanted this gloomy, nostalgic 90s movies atmosphere for this first setting, but at the same time we need the we need technologies of the near future. Players would visit quite a few alien worlds, mostly retrofuturistic, within those we have steampunk, diesel punk like civilizations. These are planetary utopias and dystopias created and known by the black and the red beings. The white beings of course have none. Uh, in short, blacks are pro-fixed life, whites are anti-life, and the reds are pro-life, or so it appears. In all these settings you will have one and the same core mission, to get away from the these black and red big teleports you would be appearing in with Obi, and to reach these specific locations farther from them, where the white beings mini teleport you are carrying can be activated. On your way to these Zemtals, uh, mini teleport activation locations, you get to explore these worlds, overcoming different obstacles and so on. Is Sam a child? In the previous story, Sam was indeed supposed to be a child, a young boy, a prodigy like no other. In the new story of the pessimist, I decided to make him older, in his 30s, to make it more realistic, uh, the time frame. Same growing up, becoming a, an excellent physicist, creating the Annihilator and whatnot. But as I said, we are keeping this old, younger look, explaining that with this rare condition that makes people look physically much younger than they actually are. I can't help but ask, the symbol on Sam's shirt looks an awful lot like the symbol for Antinatalism International. Was this intentional? Uh, true, Sam does have uh, a shirt with such a symbol. In some images he may have the other Ouroboros snake one, both are based on existing symbols, yes. A red button is one of the ideas too for the shirt. He's a semi effilist extensionist after all. In any case, no shirt symbol is definite at this time. I really liked the voice uh, in the clips that you've released so far uh, where we hear Sam's voice. Is this a child actor's voice or was this machine generated? Uh, it's one of those text-to-speech voices. It's actually really good and it fits beautifully uh, Sam's character. There is a sense of struggle in the voice. It gives this sense of a serious, intelligent individual who has been through a lot of hardship. All in all, an excellent fit and it may be hard to find a voice actor able to beat it. Can you tell me more about the dream sequence that, as far as I know, is what begins the game? 
Well, dreams tell something about us, and so Sam has all these fears about life, about worsening health, fear of failure to realize his dream of ending suffering on earth. He's bothered by many things he'll never do and have, unlike other quote-unquote normal people. So the T-Rex symbolizes all these fears, chasing him, not giving him peace. In other words, the T-Rex equals the brutal dark side of life. A monster. That's the idea behind this dream sequence. Uh, the existing one would suffer a ton of changes to better reflect all this. I love the design of Sam's home. It is gorgeous. So much detail. So many little moving bits. The animation is just incredible. I'm glad you do. The house too, or interiors in general, would as exteriors have plenty of animations in them, uh, maybe not as much as exteriors per quote-unquote square meter, or not always. But anyway, you always try to come up with as much animations as possible per scene to make them as interesting as possible. As the game is 2D, you know, 3D games, 3D spaces, you discover them. It takes time to go around and check all the corners. Here, no such thing. Uh, you see the entire scene immediately. All there is to it. This low-res still image, if you will. A still image is interesting or explorable for only so long. So the more animations in a scene, the better or less of a problem that is. Uh, the house scenes would be gradually revealed and there would be something new and interesting to see and do in each. Uh, in general, connected interior scenes would be revealed or shown separately. Who and what are the white beings, the black beings, and the red beings? What do each of them want to accomplish? I am still not sure, still haven't settled on labels for all of them. Uh, the white beings are meant to be anti any and all suffering, anti any and all life, anti any and all sentience, because they see sentience as not existable, if that's even a word, uh, free of all suffering. To them, no amount of suffering or discomfort is acceptable. So this entire race of beings is fully devoted to the elimination of life from the universe. They do not care whether a celestial object has bacteria or sentient life on it. All flames are getting extinguished in an instant. Uh, destroy the universe, ask questions later. The black beings are meant to be a somewhat tolerant uh, version of the whites, in the sense that they see the same problem of suffering the whites do, but they find some more or less insignificant unpleasantness tolerable and life filled with pleasantness worth preserving. So, unlike the white beings, what they do is they radically change existing sentience filled biospheres they discover, creating these. Uh, planetary utopias in which suffering is down to this tolerable minimum. Uh, think transhumanism, but far more advanced tech and extended to all life on the planet. Translifeism. Think Ouroboros snake, but the tail is removed from its mouth and it's eating a leaf. Planets of vegans. The red beings are meant to be the evil ones, uh, the exact opposite of the other two species, races. They appear to value suffering and they collect it in some mysterious way. Like the black beings, they have planetary but dystopias, sentience filled biospheres in which suffering is often amplified. Uh, each sentient being in a biosphere has a, a piece of tech attached to it that absorbs its suffering. When, which is then transported to their home world via these big teleports they have on each planet, as the blacks do. Now, I want the game to have an interesting ending. Uh, currently, the game ends with Sam's realization that the red beings aren't actually the bad guys, for reasons I'll explain later in the interview. As for what these beings are, it would be unclear. They appear more or less biological or organic in nature, 
but they could be artificial or maybe it's a mix. Where they originate from would also be unknown. You, I mean, what is a story without some unanswered an questions? How did Sam end up acquiring the white being and what does he hope to achieve by reviving it? Uh, in the game, it may or may not be specified where and how Sam got hold of the, of the being. Uh, ultimately, it doesn't matter. What is relevant is that the being reached, the white being reached our solar system many millions of years ago and intended to wipe life from, from Earth and from the Jupiter's moon Europa. But something prevented it from doing so. Something happened to it while it was on Earth, putting it in a cocooned offline, so to say, state. The being happens to come from an advanced alien civilization, which is, as I said, completely obsessed with the removal of life from the universe. In short, as Sam and the rest of the team are studying the being in the house, to their amazement, they discovered that it had planned to do on Earth exactly what they are trying to with the device in the house. For Sam's annihilator to annihilate Earth's Earth instantly or faster than any living thing on Earth could catch it, a component of the annihilator called the, the collector needs to be collecting certain exotic particles for about 10 years. Uh, start decreasing the years or activating the annihilator sooner and you get the annihilation that takes longer to do. To, to do the, ex the intended, and thus isn't painless. Ten years is a long time, and with the passage of it, the greater the risk of a project failure of some kind. On the other side, they are in possession of this uh, being and the, its two annihilators. They have learned a lot already about the, the being and its technology, and have managed to ready this white beings earth annihilator for the annihilation but they just can't figure out how to trigger it by reviving the white being and soon uh, they would be able to save the earth's biosphere and that of the moon europa of 10 more years of suffering what is obi the cat's role in the game how does he help sam throughout the game Obi would be helping Sam of world in many situations. Uh, the player may even take a role of Obi in some of these situations. Solving problems, Sam being both bigger and biologically different, would be unable to or it would be very difficult for him. Simply overcoming many of the obstacles in the game would require a teamwork between the two. What ends up happening on Earth and to Sam and Obi that they end up meeting so many more of the white beings than just the one that they knew on Earth? Okay, so this is going to be a longer answer, so bear with me. So Sam cannot be killing or seriously injuring opponents in the game. Uh, that presents quite a problem and in, it was quite a challenge to solve. We have Sam's pacifism on one side on the other side, we have the Black Bing's tool that would be a perfect fit as a quote-unquote weapon for him, as it would allow him to deal with opponents non lethally with little to no violence used, but it would also come handy for solving various environmental obstacles. On the, on the third side, we have all these worlds beyond Earth Sam and Obi need to go to, on the fourth side, Sam and Dobby need some kind of spacesuits to be able to survive in all these alien environments. So we have multiple how the hell does questions. Uh, how the hell, how does Sam get hold of the black tool? How the hell he knows how to use it? Where do they get the, these suits and what do they look like? And finally, what is the method, the vehicle that transports the duo to all these other settings. In the game on the present day, the quote-unquote evil red beings discovered the Earth recently and are about to create a planetary dystopia out of it, a, a biosphere in which the, uh, the existing uh, meat grinder is made far worse, put in a fifth gear, so to say. All organisms, plants included, are to be changed into carnivores. The balance would be artificially maintained by the Reds, with the 
black beings utopias we have planets of vegans as i already said with the reds these are planets of the meat eaters the drill is as follows and all three races do this have these biosphere searchers a red being a searcher going uh, quote-unquote on foot or traveling faster than light using its tachyonic vehicle or drive through the unexplored parts of the universe finds a planet with life it activates its personal or mini teleport notifies its homeworld of the discovered biosphere and soon more red beings are on the scene uh, coming out of the mini teleport after a quick survey of the planet they start bringing over parts of the big teleport via the mini teleport and start assembling it once assembled they start bringing over all the biosphere transformation technology now through this big teleport which would remain in place indefinitely the white beings annihilating biospheres don't use these big planetary teleports to expand their network of teleports. Rather, when a white being searcher goes far enough from the nearest guarded mini public teleport in the network into the unexplored area of the universe, it plants another such teleport received from its personal mini one, either hiding it on some desolate planet nearby or maybe leaving it to float in space. Back to the Earth. The red beings have finished assembling the big planetary teleport above a major city and are bringing all the necessary tech through it uh, from their homeworld. In short, they are prepping for they are prepping up for a full-scale invasion and transformation of the Earth's biosphere soon to begin. Sa same is happening over at the Jupiter's moon Europa. The white being now revived sees that the reds are here and knows what is looming and explains to sam and the rest of the team what fate awaits earth's biosphere unless it triggers its earth annihilator in the house however there's a problem there's there is still life on the jupiter's moon europa a biosphere also filled with suffering sentient beings and the white being insists on dealing with it as well these white annihilators have charge of some kind that depletes over time, slowly. Uh, along with the white being, they were sitting on Earth for millions of years and their charge is depleted to an extent, rendering them unusable. As a while ago, Sam and the team managed to transfer the remaining charge from the Europe annihilator to the Earth one, filling this one to capacity and making it ready for use. The Europe annihilator now sits empty. The white being needs to go to its homeworld to get the charge for the this Europa Annihilator. It has its mini teleport to do that. The reason why it can't trigger the Earth one now, go to the homeworld, get the charge, return field, go to Europa, is because these annihilators uh, have no effect on the on the red beings, uh, and they would easily track the source, the Sam's house and block the white being from ever returning to the solar system. There's no time and the risk is too high to go out and hide the Europa Annihilator and the Mini Teleport elsewhere, with all the red beings now slowly descending to the Earth's surface. The humanity's futile resistance against the reds has already begun. In the meantime, as Sam and others are eagerly waiting for the white being to return, and as the war against the reds rages across rages on across the earth a single black being uh, a searcher which found the solar system a bit earlier than the red searcher ends up inside the house this black being for reasons unknown is having some issues with its key tech its tachyonic vehicle or uh, its mini teleport etc they aren't working properly uh, it was unable to contact its home world and let its race capture the solar system. However, it was able to detect the presence of the white being and having no other choice headed its direction, on foot essentially, as the white tech can be used to make the repairs. But these two races of beings aren't exactly friendly and the black being of course still wants the solar system for its own race. It still isn't late for that. As our Earthlings are nervously 
nervously waiting for the white being to return and discussing whether to activate prematurely their own annihilator. If the white being doesn't show up inside the mini teleport in time, the black being enters the stage. Shortly, sh shortly after, the white being does show up and now, with the hostility between the two races and all this high, highly advanced alien tech in one place, we have the uh, opportunity to give Sam the tool, the black tool, and get him and Obi out of there, off world. A brief fight erupts between the two beings, Sam and Obi being right next to the still open white mini teleport, enter it to take cover. The black being loses its tool, which falls right where they stood. Sam picks it up, and suddenly there is a malfunction of the, of the white mini teleport, a faulty teleportation of them both and the tool into a bizarre place called the Void. At a certain point in the game, Sam is given a tool by the white beings. What is this tool, and what does it allow Sam to do? It happens in the Void. We end up solving all the all dimensioned problems in the Void. The Void is a strange place in which all, each of the three races of beings have their outposts of some kind. We solve the first problem back at the house. Sam has the tool. And now we have to teach him how to use it, uh, give the duo some kind of spacesuits, and send them on their on their journey. So. The duo is here, they are floating unconscious inside some kind of a bubble called the membrane. The membrane which we could say differ in size and stability with bigger, more stable membranes being extremely rare occurrences. Uh, will be the very, this membrane will be the very thing that drops them around the universe, randomly putting them inside these big planetary teleports, whether black or red and is an object all three races of beings are unable to create themselves, are very interested uh, in and are studying. This is precisely because the membrane has the ability to teleport itself inside all the big planetary teleports. And as each race can't do that, they can't use it, each other's teleports. If one of the races could figure out how to inject themselves, or in the case of the whites, their annihilators at least, inside the membrane, something none of them can successfully do yet, it would be possible for that race to gain access to an enemy's big teleport, to hack it in some way that forces the membrane to appear inside an enemy's homeworld teleport, causing an incredible amount of damage to them from within. Currently, the white beings can only inject certain tech and certain amount of it inside the, these uh, membranes before bursting them, all of which is of little to no use to them. With Sam and the, the Black 2 already inside this bigger, more stable membrane, the white beings' outpost could possibly achieve the infiltration. And Sam has every incentive to help them, as he learns from them that the white being on Earth failed to trigger the Annihilators, as did his team to trigger their own. The Earth is screwed for now. So, the whites grab this membrane, wake up Sam and Obi, and to an extent they teach Sam how to use the black tool inject suits for them, the mini teleport, Sam already knows a lot about from studying it uh, in the house, and they explain to him what he needs to do. Uh, the white beings are aware that the chances, uh, the chance of him su succeeding is slim, but uh, it's worth giving it, a, it's worth giving it a, a shot. By the way, the membrane would be reoccurring, that is, they, they all appear inside a big teleport, the membrane temporarily disappears, Sam and Obi do their running and else to reach the MTAL location, white mini, mini teleport activation location, and when, when returned back inside uh, a big teleport by the whites, the membrane, which only they can re-enter, Obi, Sam and Obi, reappears and off they go into another setting. Anyway, all the problems have been solved. Uh, the 
black tool has the ability to change any species of an animal or plant into a completely different one or far with the same size. In addition, it can also remove or create needs in animals or simply mentally affect them. Uh, the black beings use this technology to change entire biospheres to their liking, creating these planetary utopias. All the carnivores on a discovered or acquired planet are turned into herbivores. Pain or severe discomfort cannot be experienced anymore and so on and so forth. Highly advanced genetic engineering which has created this network of paradises in which each animal's quality of life is extremely high. Are there other tools and weapons in the game that Sam will eventually have access to? All three races of beings have tools. Uh, the black tools are essentially the same as the red tools, it's just that the former are used to create the worlds of herbivores that cannot suffer while the latter are used to create worlds of carnivores that do. The white tools are different, they can instantly end uh, the life of an individual. Uh, also, there's there's the idea for all these tools to have some kind of special combat mode applied only when these races fight each other. So, same thing, but he is, can really only use the black tool. And yes, the tool would uh, be upgradable in the sense that uh, as you make progress through the game, new features of the tool would be unlocked to you, allowing you to do interesting new stuff with it. As said, story-wise, the white beings teached you uh, the basics of the tool, allowed you to make only a few changes to animals and plants, and as the time goes by, you learn how to do more with it. Though there could be other potentially better ways of doing the upgrading. You've mentioned on your Discord that you've come up with an interesting way to eliminate enemies in a non-lethal way. Can you tell us anything about this game mechanic? Uh, as explained, the tool would allow you to change animals and plants around you to your needs, using them to, in various non-lethal ways, deal with various components. Uh, for example, in the second setting you would uh, found uh, yourself in a utopia and be chased by its guards or quote-unquote police force, these tall humanoid aliens. Uh, there would also be these elite guards carrying black tools of their own, which can do more or less what yours can. Uh, However, uh, all the parties, uh, all the parties are immune to these black tools. So both you and the elite guards would use animals and plants around to stop each other. In their case, to capture you. For example, imagine a tree. You can't climb it easily or at all. But if you could reach the top, you would be able to jump on this balcony you so badly need to be on, and can't reach any other way. Using the black tool, you temporarily change the tree into a different one, which looks like a ladder. You can now climb it easily and reach the desired location. Similar with uh, animals, you see a group of birds, you mentally change them so they uh, become angry at the guard that is chasing you. They attack him and during all that commotion you are able to escape him or maybe pass by him. You get the picture. Uh, this would be the core gameplay. Uh, now. The plan is for each setting to have a bit different core gameplay. Uh, for example, the second utopia is a water planet. You are in, you are underwater city. You are in an underwater city, so we have a different, different environment, different animals and plants. Thus, the core gameplay must also differ to an extent. Can you tell us a little bit more about the teleportation system in the game and how it works? So, all three races of beings use teleportation as the means of reaching more distant parts of the universe, farther from their home worlds. Each race has a huge network of teleports spreading from its home world. Home worlds which contain these gigantic main teleports or simply the home world teleports. From a home world or through a home world teleport, one can reach any of these smaller teleports in its network. A network traffic which goes both ways from and to a homeworld is controlled by it. How it actually works under the hub? Uh, at the core is this idea of the perfect balance or identical states. Special particles inside a teleport attach themselves to the particles of the payload inside and when ready the balance with the target teleport's guts is forced. These special particles in it now must recreate the exact payload to establish uh, the perfect equilibrium, as the elimination of the payload in the other one is blocked. Shortly after the equilibrium is unforced, it can't last for too long and uses a lot of energy to maintain, 
and the initial state of the of one payload only existing uh, must return but now the elimination of the payload on the target side is blocked causing the other to disappear instead so the payload is teleported from point a to point b from one teleport to another Regarding the gameplay, do you score points in the game? Does the game have a currency of any kind? Are there items that you need to buy or upgrade or work up to? Uh, scoring isn't planned at the moment, though it could be done. Uh, for example, these takedowns of opponents would differ in the amount of discomfort they create in them. The less violent you are throughout the game, the higher the score you are rewarded with, and maybe sufficiently high scores unlock certain content. So we'll see. There may be looting of some sort, uh, but at this time it's not that clear what that might look like and exist for what purposes. Uh, in, in video games, uh, uh, weapons need ammo and you often grab food and cash and valuables around to buy stuff. The problem is we have settings that quite differ one from another and while the tool, for example, could need recharging every now and then, and we place charging stations in these utopian cities you'd be in. What about the two dystopias? The different home worlds you'd also visit. Regarding food, perhaps you could use the tool to change alien plants into Earth-like ones slash food for you and Obi to eat and maintain the health bars, which are also in question. All in all, there, there are many things left to define here. I just... Uh, presenting the core gameplay concept and it's something to build upon later. There was no time for more. You've mentioned, I believe, somewhere on your Discord that there have been abandoned storylines over time. Can you tell me more about some of those? Uh, there have been quite a few stories before this story of the pessimist. None of those had anything to do with antinatalism, ethalism, veganism, etc. Early on, I remember wanting to create a dystopian, brutalist city of some kind and you join the resistance to fight the oppressive elite. It was mediocre as hell. Uh, the name Raw Concrete originates from that time. The story prior to the current one had to do with the tra time travel and I went into insane details regarding the way this time machine works. I came up with this extensive fictional science of it. I wanted the game to really impress with actually explaining how the time travel works rather than just uh, throwing around these generic physics terms like dark matter, dark energy and whatnot, and moving on. Because ultimately it doesn't matter. But I asked the question, what if one did what if one did care? Could you come up with a compelling original or fictional science behind it? I said it's in my nature. I like doing things nobody else thought of before. Uh, the first setting uh, would have been the same as is now. We, we are on Earth. Sam is a filthy rich physicist who always dreamed of creating a time machine. His parents died here too. And if I remember correctly, he was terminally ill. Some super rare, poorly studied disease. Uh, he finished the time machine in secret and has donated huge amounts of money to some biomedical labs, hoping that the cure will be available some 10 years later. And 10 years he plans to go forward in time. The black and white beings have their origins in this story, but I forgot their exact roles in it. In any case, uh, in the end of this setting, Sam would have entered this huge time machine with Obi. There would have been a fatal error of some, of some kind, and the two would have been sent back and forward in time. For example, one of the settings would have been the Earth during the Cretaceous period. The end of it, you know, dinosaurs. That would have been interesting to see. Uh, both Sam and Obi would have been in space suits, basically, and Sam was supposed to carry a ballistic weapon of some kind first. This one was called the Transmutator, I think. Uh, you collect various materials, metals, rubber, glass, wood and whatnot, and they are turned into these various projectiles. That weapon was scrapped and Sam was supposed to carry this other alien weapon instead, similar in appearance to the black tool, but not in uh, function. It was meant to create projectiles or constructs uh, based on time. A straight moving dot creates a line. That is, you make all these dots in time exist at the same time and you create a line or quote-unquote a spear. 
a moving line creates a plane or a blade, a wall, an obstacle, etc. You get the idea. Anyway, I wasn't satisfied with uh, this story either. There was this foundation that looked promising, but I just wasn't able to figure out the rest of the game. And besides, time travel has been done in numerous other IPs, so it wouldn't be that original. And I very much wanted it to be. I wanted a unique, epic story. Having already discovered antinatalism and nephilism a year or so prior, I took the bold decision to change the story significantly and have it be inspired by these and other philosophies. In some of the videos and images that you've released of the game so far, there are comic bubbles of dialogue and notes included. Will those remain in the game, do you think? And even if not, do you think these examples could possibly, you know, cross over into a graphic novel version of perhaps? The game would not be using those. All characters would have voices. And yeah, I had been thinking about doing if the game format of this IP fails a comic instead uh, that would look a lot like the game having pages that would look like screenshots from it. It's appealing actually, you know, no need for anim animators, programmers, etc. I can do it entirely by myself. But this idea kind of cooled off, so I'd likely be done with the IP if the Kickstarter fails. Are the white beings also seeking their own extinction? Uh, no, the universe is infinite, and thus the quote-unquote job of removing suffering from it is never-ending. Uh, we can say that themselves do experience certain suffering. For one, they are deeply bothered by exactly that, all these undiscovered biospheres out there. The, the, this vast suffering they can't do anything about, or not yet. But each annihilated biosphere makes a huge difference, and they are willing to endure. There is this idea for the super annihilator the white beings have been making for quite a long time inside their home world, which when triggered would in theory create a uh, faster than light ever accelerating eternal life annihilation bubble. Uh, such a bubble would make the existence of the white beings unnecessary for the obvious reason and they would be at liberty to turn their lights off. But they are still far uh, from finishing this thing, and it may not work as intended. Who are the Babai? Uh, I love this part of the game you're developing about the alpha antinatalist and the AI they create to finish their task of sentient extinction. Can you tell us all about this part of the game? This is the fourth setting, the the first of the two dystopias or Red Beings biospheres. Uh, its story was not entirely made by me. This uh, guy from Reddit by the name of Voidnor had some interesting ideas, I adopted and adjusted to a degree too, so they can fit in the existing story of the game. This is a civilization much like the one on Earth in 2040-ish. They have entered their own fourth industrial revolution. I haven't uh, yet named all the other human aliens on these other planets, but have done so here. Uh, Babai are the dominant species on this planet of carnivores. They are short and obese looking with unpleasant facial features, uh, sharp teeth, pointy ears, etc. Think of the Violator from Spawn, uh, that kind of a nasty look. But Babai are not evil. The story of this setting goes something like this. Uh, with the emergence of the higher intelligence on the planet, or the Babais, forced by the Red Beings, they, the Reds, had to make their, their presence on the planet a secret. Uh, the big red teleport, previously out in the open, had to be hidden somewhere, despite the teleport as all the other tech of theirs having an invisibility switch. It's their standard practice to hide uh, a planetary teleport on a planet beneath a planet's aquatic or non-aquatic slash dry terrain surface instead of in space or in the sky. Uh, why so? The black beings' planets have a protective... the black beings. Planets have a protective stratospheric shell of some kind, uh, visible at all times, protecting uh, the planet from natural and other hazards. These other hazards are the red beings primarily and the whites. Uh, the same kind of biosphere protection is used by the reds, by the red beings, for the same purposes, with the only difference being that their shell becomes invisible for uh, the reason already explained. Uh, species of higher intelligence. 
It's simply safer to have the big teleport within the shell and hidden on the ground uh, because if it goes offline while in the sky it becomes visible and falls down and could be found easily by the intelligent humanoids. Over time we could say the teleport changed few locations. The last location is this big cave beneath a dense forest. The cave had special entrance opened and <clears throat> closed when things needed to go in and out of the teleport. Again, during this time and outside, the Red Wings and their various tech is invisible. Many, many years back from the present time, uh, while all the Red Wings of this biosphere were inside the cave, something happened which killed them all and had shut down the teleport. This very distant biosphere was cut from their homeworld. It would take quite a time for other Red Wings to reach it again. We could say the absorbers, these things... That How many chapters in the game are there currently, and do you think more will still be added? There would be four chapters or eight settings in total, so quite a bit actually. I said it would be a long game. Chapter 1 is the Earth, Chapter 2 these two Utopias, Chapter 3 the two Dystopias, Chapter 4 the Homeworlds, all three Homeworlds. Uh, with the Red Wings home uh, being the end of the game, the last setting. Are elements of the story still being developed at this point? The core story and the core gameplay is there and I'm more than happy with them. Uh, of course, there is plenty of room for improvements and further development, but for now it's enough. Uh, like, I'm just one guy at this point and there is only so much I can do. What kind of music do you believe you'll settle on for the game? Will the game have an original score? As with other aspects of the game, we would try to create a score unique to it, something interesting and as original as possible. For example, certain classical music fits quite nicely, at least it fits a few of the comic videos I did. Uh, we have alien and retro-futuristic settings uh, and dark philosophical tone to the game, so I guess we are talking about a mix of genres. How long do you believe the game will be? Like, how many hours of gameplay? The rough estimation is about 12 hours, so long, 8 settings in total, about 1 to 2 hours per each. In reality, some would be longer, some shorter. Will there be multiple endings to the game? Uh, most likely. We have these three races of beings, and perhaps at the end, having a clear picture of each, we let the player choose which race to endorse for good. Do you choose one of the two ways of ending all life in the universe, or do you side with the black beings and let idyllic life flourish in their ever-expanding network of utopias. At this time there is a single, in a way, very sad and quite bizarre ending. Uh, you end up endorsing the plan of the quote-unquote evil red beings because it, looked, it looks like the best solution. Is the game intended for all ages? No, no, uh, this would not be rated E, uh, for sure. Uh, the game would have a serious dark philosophical tone, so definitely age-restricted, not for kids. Do you hope to be able to port the game to consoles eventually? N no such plans. Uh, it would be my first game and it would be for the PC only, to make the development easier. If it would happen to be a huge success, then porting might happen. This may be more than you can reveal about the game at this time, and if it is, I completely understand. But does Sam die at the end of the game? Uh, unknown at this time. Uh, in the current ending, which is quite a twist actually, Sam realizes that the Red Beings are more advanced than the other two races, and that their solution, though quite hard to comprehend and accept, is actually the best one, even though on the surface it looks absolutely horrible. He decides not to screw them over and activate the white mini teleport while in their home world. What happens beyond this realization hasn't been defined. I basically spoiled this uh, ending entirely. Uh, it's explained in one of the YouTube videos. I did so because I'm pretty sure most people wouldn't give it enough pause and understand it anyway. But more because the actual ending of the game, if it ever comes out, would certainly be better or different in many ways. So it's not that big of a deal to show the this current ending. Uh, in summary, all the suffering uh, that the red beings are causing it's is not actually created by them. Rather, it already exists in the quote-unquote code of the universe. Anything possible exists already. 
The red beings are merely accessing the existing suffering and taking it for themselves, accumulating it. And when a proper quantity is reached, they would inject it all inside this god-like entity, the coder. They captured somehow in, in two rounds of suffering or, or, or torture uh, uh, to force the entity to edit the code of the universe and make the uh, necessary changes uh, to it so that uh, life becomes an impossibility for all the eternity forward. Maybe it's silly, maybe not. Uh, I don't know. But that's uh, the current ending. I think you've done a really amazing job of preserving a kind of like boy and his dog adventure story in The Pessimist, uh, despite the pessimism and the extinctionist tone. Uh, there's a kind of whimsy and fun uh, that this it sort of reminds me of Little Nemo in Dreamland almost, as Sam and Obi explore these worlds and go about their mission. And I think that's a real achievement in the case of this of this story, because Sam is certainly not your typical hero, so to speak. Uh, he is a kind of anti-hero really i mean even perhaps somebody that some players of the game would see as a villain um do you have any thoughts about any of that well yeah if one's reference is basically every other game or a movie out there sam does look like a villain uh, an evil scientist who wants to destroy the world as explained before the job of the first on earth setting would be to show that sam isn't a bad person that though it may appear so initially on the contrary through various situations in and around the house, we would show that Sam isn't any, any villain, but an extremely kind-hearted person. As always, the devil is in the details. There's a palpable sense of Sam's depression on Earth. He is a tragic kind of character, at least until he has, you know, his full mission set out before him. And I think it's interesting that once he's on his mission for full Sand ex extinction across all these worlds, he seems so much happier, almost like he's, you know, finally being able to live out the happy boyhood that uh, being an extinctionist on Earth has sort of robbed him of. Am I way off in seeing things this way? Uh, yes, he has quite a few reasons to be happy. Uh, he's helping the white beings so the earth can be saved from the reds, as well as countless other biospheres. So he's excited to be a key player in preventing huge amounts of suffering. Further, he is uh, able to be himself on these alien worlds. He doesn't have to wear that uncomfortable prosthetic mask nor hide his identity anymore. The, there are no humans around to ridicule him. So yeah, despite all this pressure he's under to succeed, Sam would certainly feel happier uh, out there. What do you most hope people come away with after having played The Pessimist? Well, I would hope for a lasting impression. Uh, from birth, we are all conditioned to view life as something unquestionably positive. We have this biological conditioning and from it culture. It's like leave life, ask questions later. Well, you know, fuck that. Uh, being an atheist my whole life and uh, being depressed for quite a part of it uh, because reasons I still suffered from this positivity bias you know romanticizing about life okay there is no evidence of God or gods but it, it's not that bad there's art creativity etc all this cool stuff it's fine uh, then the wind pushed this colorful bubble of mine in, in Mendham's direction and he burst it with such ease, uh, such speed, it's funny almost. So I'd like the game to maybe not burst people's bubbles, but at least get them out of them, if only for a brief moment, uh, sparking conversations about all these important uh, philosophical and ethical questions. I think that an antinatalist themed video game is a really unique opportunity to expose new people to these ideas. Maybe more so than any other medium, even. I feel like a game, literally something that models reality and allows for an emotional connection with its characters, uh, is a, it's just a game changer for antinatalist activism. Do you consider the game an act of antinatalist and ethalist activism? Uh, indeed, unlike movies, games are more personal however the issue with the games is that the storytelling is usually secondary to the gameplay in many ways the the core gameplay controls the the story and so it begs the question can you really make a good story in a video game does it even matter 
A quote from Ken Levine, the creative director and lead writer on the Bioshock series, comes to mind. The quote, the bad news for storytellers is that nobody cares about your stupid story. Uh, in the case of the pessimist, the, the core gameplay came out of the story, not the other way around. It's a truly story-driven game. The story uh, uh, created all these restrictions and the gameplay is to be molded from them. It made it quite a challenge, of course, uh, a very interesting one, I have to add. How the hell do you make the core gameplay interesting when the main protagonist is a pacifist and cannot carry conventional weapons, assault rifles, rocket launchers, etc., something that is a standard arsenal in so many games. But things are possible given enough time and effort. I am, as I said, very proud of the core gameplay I came up with. Uh, it looks, I think it looks promising, very promising. Uh, steps in the right direction. It's been really amazing over the last couple of years watching what really is the birth of antinatalist fiction or speculative fiction. And some really wonderful work has already come out of that, such as Conor Garcia's Last Call for Heroes, The Offset by Calder Shevchek, and now You're the Pessimist, which I think which I also think is very much a part of this trend. But what, in your opinion, uh, do you think can be done in the real world? What do you believe an antinatalist future really looks like on Earth, if it were to be possible? Every prevented birth of a sentient being is not uh, a bad thing, and one can spare quite a few sentient beings of the existence. We start by our own examples, deciding not to procreate. Who knows how many sentient beings one saves with such a decision down the line, so to say. You can neuter uh, your pets and these strays if you have the means. So yeah, one can make quite a difference uh, in, the, in the real world. Then there's euthanasia, the right to die, perhaps something can be done there too. Now, I don't think governments would sit idle and let an antinatalism spread around for the obvious reasons. Not just governments, some other organizations too. We all know the reason why you can't find a single photo of David Bennett around the internet. Uh, antinatalism appears to be gaining popularity and is being talked about in many places in the first time, or for the first time. Uh, it would surprise me if there are no crackdowns of any in the near future. So you will be launching a Kickstarter campaign for The Pessimist. I'm so excited about that. I so hope that it ends up being uh, beyond successful. How much are you trying to raise for the completion of the game? I am still undecided whether to ask for the funding of the full game or a part of it. Uh, based on the experience so far, the expenses, this would not be a cheap game to make. I've checked similar games out there. For example, the budget of the Ori and the Blind Forest was $6 million. I don't know how much they spent on marketing, but whatever, six million. I haven't played it, but from what I've seen, that game has a single setting, a forest. The graphics, for example, though being a higher resolution, is cartoonish. It's very beautiful, of course, but my point is you have trees, rocks, and that's about it. Not that difficult to create. Though still, I'm sure it took a lot of time and effort, but you get the point. The the pessimist on the other side would have an entirely handcrafted high fidelity, high realism pixelated graphics with no tiles, say it, very different settings, mostly urban, quite populated settings with a unique architecture and flora and fauna in each and so on and so forth. Uh, given I would be doing all the in-game graphics and few other things, as was the case so far, I can be paid with sandwiches, metaphorically speaking. There likely isn't a pixel artist out there who can do this kind of pixel art anyway. At least I haven't seen one yet. So, uh, asking for millions of dollars is out of the question, of course. The maximum amount I dare to ask for the full game, a number that should be enough to more or less successfully finish the game, is around $400,000. 318000 or close, to be more precise. Given the highly pessimistic tone to the game and not much of the actual gameplay done, I'm not optimistic about this goal sum. Alternatively, I can ask for just the first half of the game or even less, just the first two chapters. Uh, that's three settings. 
you know, split the game in few sequels. Uh, this might be a better path to take. Might. So let's say around $150,000 uh, as it goes. Either way, the game seems uh, screwed. We'll see once I finish that uh, poster I told you about. I'll have to make a few of these important final decisions. Once all the funds have hopefully been successfully raised, how long do you believe production will take from there? About four years, uh, give or take. It would be an endeavor. What can we expect from the Kickstarter campaign? Will there be donation tiers, prizes, or rewards for levels of donation? The cut content, which there is a plenty of, will be used uh, for rewards, in addition to a few other things. Uh, the more you donate, the more of the cut content you get, with video explanations of why the cutting was done. I want to keep it simple and not make it uh, too of a burden. In addition to donations, are there any other ways people can help you? Are you still looking for voice actors? Are there any other ways people can contribute to you know, bringing the pessimist to life? Uh, marketing. The game has been poorly marketed so far. The biggest problem is the lack of gameplay. I keep saying with pretty pictures you can do only so much. So the fan base appears to be quite small. Uh, new story meant starting from scratch, basically, in that regard. Anyway, aside from donations, one can help by simply sharing the game around, at least when the Kickstarter campaign goes online. Credit to you for this interview, it will definitely help in that. You've also recently been creating some other uh, beautiful pieces of antinatalist art outside of the game. Can you tell me anything about these pieces? For a while I had this desire to do more traditional art in addition to what I am already doing professionally and otherwise. For example, I enjoy Renaissance paintings a lot. I wish to do paintings like that. Now, being captured by the pessimism and with the appearance of these eye text image tools, there was the opportunity to do what I wanted. I'm now very serious about it and this has now grown into a separate project. I want to become a super famous pessimistic artist. Yeah, I wish to live long enough to do quite a few of these thought-provoking antinatalism themed uh, art pieces. Ten at least. After this interview I'll be finishing this third ATA or Rata, as I call it, piece uh, even bigger than the previous two. Nanad, the pessimist is brilliant, and so are you. You are frighteningly talented, my friend. Uh, it has been nothing short of just a miracle watching this project uh, grow over the time that I've been, you know, keeping up with your Discord and watching your updates online. Um, I so hope that the Kickstarter ends up being successful. I have said it already, but I will say it again. The Pessimist, I really and truly do believe, is one of the most important pieces of antinatalist art and activism to ever be attempted. So best of luck. Um, I so hope that, you know, in the near future you have great news uh, about the project. I will be anxiously awaiting every development. Um, thank you so much for your work. Uh, I really, really cannot, it really cannot be understated how important I do believe it to be. Um, and thank you so much for being my guest today on the Exploring Antinatalism podcast. It's been an honor. Thank you for inviting me. I really, really appreciate it. Please follow the work of Nanad Gojkovic on Vimeo and both of his YouTube channels, and make sure to join the Raw Concrete Discord server where you can keep up to date with all the news about The Pessimist. Links below. Thank you for listening to the Exploring Antinatalism podcast. Please follow the podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Exploring Antinatalism can also be heard on Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Buzzsprout, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Amazon.com, and so many other platforms. You can email me at exploringantinatalism at gmail.com. Website designed by Visions Noirs. Please follow him at www.bionoir.com and follow him on Instagram. Logo art by Life Sucks. Please subscribe to him on YouTube and check out his shop on Etsy at www.etsy.com slash shop slash Life Sucks Publishing. Music by Mati Hairi. You can hear the whole song, Life is a Sexually Transmitted Disease with a Mortality Rate of 100% by following the link in the description. And make sure to also read his academic paper, which inspired the song, If You Must Give Them a Gift, Then Give Them the Gift of Non-Existence, in the Cambridge Quarterly of Healthcare Ethics on cambridge.org. Links below. All the best, and bye for now. Tu 
Thank you. 